among our favorites here on the show. Uh, has a Heritage Restaurant there in uh, Fort Lauderdale. It's red hot. It's smoking hot. Reno Serbone uh, joins us here on the show, our, our hockey uh, analyst. What is it that uh, has these franchises uh, turning on Gerard Gallant, no matter what level of success he has? Uh, now we're yeah. no longer coaching. But, I mean, it, it was three times he was doing well with the Panthers. They threw him off the team bus uh, in a snow oh. drift in Saskatchewan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, he was that doing was great with the Vegas Golden Knights, uh, and they, uh, you know, sent him out to the bunny ranch there and said, hey, take one up the ass, uh, Gerard. Yeah. You're out of here. <laughs> yeah. yeah ben, doing well with the Rangers, <laughs> and uh, they wouldn't even sell him a knish on the street corner after a couple of years of uh, what looked like pretty successful hockey. Well, what is it about that guy? Do you know anything uh, on uh, Jerron yeah, Gallant? Yeah. He was another one. You, you know, it's funny. First off, look, as a Panther fan, that shit that, you know, that happened with him, that he got thrown off the plane or bus, whatever it was, yeah. that was, that was the worst thing ever. If I were him, I would have waited for the whole front office to be, like, in the building, and I would have lit it on fire. That, <laughs> that, 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 that's bullshit, right? They had Yager throwing his duffel bag out the window as they left him literally, like, in a snowdrift somewhere. Yeah, like an orphan. It was fucking terrible, <laughs> man. It was absolutely... They, they gave him cab for you know I'm the first guy, man. If I got a problem with you, <laughs> yeah. I'll pack your shit for you, and I'll, yes. I'll, I'll throw it at you. <laughs> As I make the whole team just, like, defecate in it. The time! Wake up with Defo, joined by Luby. Welcome to the Defo Show. All right, all right, all right. Uh, we got something going here. Mike Luby Lubitz, Jeff DeForest with you, the uh, Defoe Show. Uh, some technical difficulties. I was supposed to log into another show before we got started. And, of course, uh, it was it was my bad. I, I, I'm clicking on the wrong thing. And I, I instead of clicking on the link, I, I'm clicking on this guy's card that he sent me as part of the attachment. So, And I'm trying to sign into this thing, and uh, the time is evaporating. I was only going to be on this show for like 10 minutes, and I finally got in with like 30 seconds to go in the time slot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Then we try to uh, do our uh, no-filter thing, uh, Caffeine TV, the morning briefing, and uh, Luby's computer is on the fritz. And uh, now you say uh, you have what? I is it odd or ironic or at all coincidental that it's the F and the U that are sticking <laughs> on your computer keyboard, Luby? What the hell is that? Have that. you been typing <laughs> too many four-letter words as, uh, you know, uh, to try and uh, heighten and, and increase the awareness of, uh, you know, where, what your position was? So, uh, anyway, good to, good to be with you, uh, Luby. It's unbelievable. I, I mean, uh, we always talk about this. It's the bets that you don't make. And now it's too late in hindsight to go back and uh, actually do this. But uh, think of this for a second, people. Everybody's looking for a way out. I, I don't know that it's easy to find one. A way out. Not necessarily all together. I mean, that, that happens. And uh, yet, you know, when it does, uh, you know, that that's it. I, I don't believe that there's much more going on after that. I don't know about you, Luby. What do you think? Are you there, like, uh, with, with harps playing as you enter the pearly gates and all of your friends greet you and go, Defo, you made it? <laughs> It'd be nice. I'm thinking know. you're sucking worms, I mean. <laughs> yeah, the older I get, the more realistic I get, and I, yeah. I lean your way. But uh, So, like you say, it means just uh, enjoy every moment we have here and uh, don't lament some of the uh, failures, even though it, sometimes it's tough, especially in the gambling world. <laughs> yes, and, and this would be a colossal one because uh, uh, it never occurred to me to do this. So we did recommend that you bet the Marlins under 79, which they now have to play. What would 79 wins uh, what would be, what, four games under 500 for the season? So they now have to play four games, uh, whatever. Uh, is it four games above 500? I don't the know. The rest of the way, which is not happening. Not happening. <laughs> you have to I mean, they're, they're aware of this bullshit, uh, <laughs> even in New York. Uh, and this is uh, a team that they would pay no attention to otherwise. But uh, it, it already is implying that there'll be a fire sale with the Marlins before uh, too much time passes. I mean, they're I, get rid of all of their good players. That it's over. Just, the fact that they're 0 and 9 and they've now blown is a 5. 0 and 8, 0 and 8 at this point. 0 and 8. Okay. Yeah. 0 and 8. And they've blown four different games where they had multiple run leads in the late innings. Yes, including not, yesterday. Like that, and your boy Sixto, it's him like, they were up 5-3 in the seventh. I look away, I, I look back, and it's 6-5. I'm like, that's about right. He, he's a disaster so far. The, the two times I've seen him come into ball games, uh, he, he gave up a home run on the first pitch uh, to uh, help, uh, I think that was in the Pirate Series, to tie the game, uh, in, in the seventh inning also. And now he comes in in the seventh. I don't know if he got anybody out. Because um, I, I wasn't watching with, with any great detail, but uh, you're, you're thinking, 
really? They're going to blow this one too? Uh, all right, so so here's the opportunity we missed. Uh, under 79, uh, it appears like if you took our recommendation, you probably coasting. You could probably line up at the window right now. Yeah, you're coasting. And and, and ask the uh, casino manager if they're willing. To, yeah, look, you guys are losing this bet. So why don't you just give me my money right now? In fact, I'll take half of it right now and walk away. Would you take half? No, you would want to double down on this thing, would you not? <laughs> How fucking fantastic is this? But um, here's the opportunity that we whiffed on, uh, Luby, and it's not good. Okay. Uh, had we just gone ahead and, and from opening day parlayed the Marlins $100 through the eight games, you, you know what your total would be right now? You would have walked away with it. You would have had to be tempted to go ahead and cash out. I mean, did you see? I, we saw them not getting to 79 wins. You saw them being 0 and 8. Like, I, even yeah. I. Didn't see them being 0 and 8. Like, I'm not who's a, 0 and 8? Nobody, even the Mets won a game yesterday. The, the UConn run that the jersey, cut, <coughs> and even he didn't go all the way through with it. And yeah, was lamented was feasible. You could see Ken Bill Walker was already a good player. They, I think, they struggled with injuries that year, and then they got healthy right before the the uh Wiggies tournament. And then they went on a run. And after that tournament, you could see Kemba had, 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 was lit, was on fire, so you could almost see. It, and if you didn't do it, okay. This, I ain't 0 and 8. <laughs> 0 and 8. Yeah, that's a hard one to predict. Four leads into the <laughs> seventh, like four nights. They were up two runs. Like, and it was impossible. Solid, like, <laughs> yeah. Pitching's horrible. Uh, this Perez kid who they were, it was the one guy that was untouchable. He was all Elliot Ness. They, they uh, now have to endure a season without him, uh, with Tommy John. In fact, uh, Dr. James Andrews is now a bench coach for the yes. Miami Marlins. That's the, they actually, need this fucking guy. I mean, uh, unbelievable. Every guy's got Tommy John. I think Skip Schumacher had Tommy John. He hurt his uh, elbow, the ulnar uh, collateral nerve there, nerve as he was uh, filling out a lineup card, making a lot of scratches because uh, everybody gets hurt. Uh, if you would parlay this from game one, <coughs> excuse me here, Luby, a little uh, schmutz there in the throat, yeah, but yeah. If you had parlayed this from game one, uh, you, you would have cashed tickets. Uh, you would have cashed out last night at $25,600. <laughs> Imagine it. Just for letting it ride, Luby. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, why would you? Like, <clears throat> excuse me. Why would I? Like, I if I had actually thought they'd go in, I would actually be mad at myself. Because even the worst teams ever don't. That's why it's, it's national news. Because they're starting. They're getting to, like, historical level. You let it go one more time. They don't play today. But if you let it go into Saturday's game, I mean, you're risking 25-6. You're actually thinking, well, I only started with 100. <laughs> but how far do you string this thing out? Are you willing to go one more round, Luby? Because if you do, it's 51-2. $51,200 if you just let this parlay go for nine games. Okay. Incredible. And and they lose. Uh, you know, and then, then you'd be going for 100 if they make it to 0-10. How long would you keep this right? I mean, w would you have cashed out after a couple of games? So wouldn't you think? Yeah, After they lost three to the Pirates, don't you think they salvage? I mean, how typical is that? Even the worst of teams salvage game four of a four-game homestand, a uh, home series, to start a homestand. Start, now, never mind starting a season. But, uh, you know, I mean, no matter how much baseball do you need to watch before you realize that uh, no matter what happened in the first three games, no matter how much of a slaughter lopsided result you got, that uh, the team that lost the first three is probably winning the fourth game. No? You would think See, a four-game sweep? No. It doesn't <laughs> happen that often. Anyway, uh, we missed out on that. Speaking of cruel and unusual, uh, and this was really, really sad, uh, and, and involved a local DJ here, this uh, Ron Brewer, also known as Young Ron, more popularly and uh, more commonly known as Young Ron. I don't think anybody really knew his last name, did you? I didn't know his Ron Brewer. Brewer. Yeah. Uh, not, not until he, not until People I, were saying Ron Brewer checked out. I thought he was a first baseman for the yeah, Guardians. I, I really did. It was like, like who, who the hell is Ron Brewer? <laughs> and it was, oh, yeah, Young Ron. Yes. But we were talking in the clip uh, before the show got going there with uh, Reno Serbone, who's always brilliant here, and actually overwhelmingly impressed me with his contemporary hockey knowledge. I didn't think, I didn't think that's why we were uh, having him on the show. I, I, I know he's hysterically funny, and he's got a great approach to life. He does a tremendous job at his restaurant, Heritage. And, and then the tie to Roberto Luongo gives us some background shit that we couldn't get from anybody else. And he's not afraid to go ahead and, and relay some of these stories about the nights that he was out in uh, Ottawa with Todd Bertuzzi. Yep. Hysterical stuff. But I, I didn't realize uh, how, how tuned in he was to what's actually going on in the game today. No, it's, uh, I think it's a sport <laughs> where a lot of us follow hockey and passing. He played it most of his life. And then on top of that, his brother, Roberto Luongo, who was an executive 
with the Florida Panthers, the team he grew up rooting for. So yep. that ties in where he's already a fan and now he gets to get inside in a way most people can't. Like the stuff he cut, he's in tune with is stuff we would never even think of. Uh, they righted the ship, by the way, last night. Uh, the yeah, Panthers uh, six zip. They had two goals in a minute thirty seven, yeah, and that was the fastest two goals they've ever scored at the outset of a game. Nice a minute and thirty seven seconds. Uh, so uh, Ottawa didn't offer a whole lot of resistance the rest of the way. Six nothing was the final there, and uh, the Panthers snapped. Uh, what was that? Was that a two game losing streak that they were on? Yes, it was they relatively minor. Times. But there was uh, there was reason uh, for concern, uh, you know, uh, emerging concern, because this, this is not the time of the year that you want things to fall apart. Uh, your man, Aaron Eckblad, by the way, out for the rest of the regular season. Of course he is. <laughs> I was going to say, he's actually played a year where he wasn't that hurt. Yeah, was but I, I guess it implies that he's coming back for the playoffs. So, uh, okay, that's fine. The frequently uh, and oft injured Aaron Eckblad uh, will not play the uh, remaining games, but uh, I'm not sure of what level of consequence they are. I mean, you're looking at a seeding for the postseason. Uh, you're you're going to be in the upper half uh, of the eight teams that get in on the Eastern Conference side. So uh, what? You're going to be playing a team that uh, what was, you know, uh, maybe battling all the way to the end. Who, who knows? We'll see what happens with that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we were talking about the coldness of, of the Gerard Gallant. And, and and it happened to Gallant. It's true. When you recount everything, uh, what what did this guy do? Did he just tell the owner constantly to go fuck himself? I, what could he possibly have done? He was successful in every spot. Mm -hmm. Here, I mean, he he was doing great things uh, for a while. I, I don't know what uh, that season obviously had to be. Uh, you know, somewhat yes, swinging right. in a the balance there because uh, it wouldn't have even been suspect uh, that that he should lose his job. But sort of came out of nowhere, didn't it, uh, Luby? When, when uh, they they dumped him in the middle of the season, yeah, like that was weird. They were at, look every year for the Panthers until the last like four were rough, but it wasn't like it, you could point to him. They had a lot of issues. They had a lot yeah. of issues for years, and he was actually a solid coach. Yeah, it seemed to be the least of their problems uh, at that point. So they fire him. And Las Vegas, how much better could they have done under Gerard Gallant? He was their original coach uh, for the expansion franchise, and he takes them into the Stanley Cup final. In, in what? Uh, didn't they make it there in their first year? The yes. Las Vegas Golden Knights? Stanley yes. Cup fucking final. Uh, the guy yes. takes an expansion team. Now, now the NHL had screwed up. And uh, they have uh, a penchant and a tendency to allow expansion teams, which I think is actually a good philosophy. Uh, Gary Bettman, for all of his faults, uh, which, what would you say? Is he the least respected of commissioners, Gary Bettman? And, and, and maybe that's unfair at this point because we have Rob Manfred with baseball. I was going to say... <laughs> People may not know Manfred is the MLB commissioner. So that's the only, only reason that he's not the the <laughs> least respected. But it's not like Manfred set the world on fire. So <laughs> no, I mean a lot of controversial stuff with this guy. The A's, by the way, moving to West Sacramento. We're not exactly a bastion of uh, sports fanaticism. I, I would think. Uh, I mean, how many people are going to be attending those games? And, and the owners up there putting on a straight face while he's saying. Well, we're so excited to be playing in this intimate setting here. In the <laughs> middle of fucking nowhere. I mean, Oakland may have been uh, the redheaded stepchild of the San Francisco in the Bay Area. That, that's possible. But uh, West Sacramento, I can't imagine that that uh, is really going to be any kind of panacea for success for the Oakland A's in terms of being a gate attraction for the next three years. I mean, people will forget they're even in the major leagues, which they... If they haven't already, incredible. Holy Charlie Finley, he's got to be spinning in his grave like some of those, uh, what are those called, sawfish that are all wa washing up on the beach uh -huh. in Key West, and they're just like spinning out of control. Man. It's uh, it's crazy <laughs> what's going on. But sugar in the world, that, that, that's what's happening, and that's what I want to talk about. But but the indignity that, that was suffered by Gerard Gallant well, when they just they dumped him here, uh, the Vegas thing, I don't know what happened there. The Rangers seem to be fine. Uh, they're doing even better now that he's not there. What do they have? Lavalette? Is that the guy that took over for the Rangers? I think so. Yeah. Uh, I've seen him around. Where, where was he before? With Pittsburgh, this guy? Lavalette, uh, coach of the Rangers. Well, we should know. I mean, it shows you what we know about hockey. Fucking nothing because uh, you know, we shouldn't even be discussing it except Reno Sarbone uh, what was uh, very impressive. But the indignity that was suffered by Gerard Gallant uh, paled in comparison to uh, some of the things, some of the nightmares that happen when you get canned from a radio job, Louie, as you <laughs> experienced yourself, right? 
I like see. you were going to steal. And you would have been the client, I guess, if I was going to have security escort somebody out. Yeah, you're too honest to steal from somebody, though. Luke. No, I wouldn't steal. He you would take he was, all of the leftovers from a lunchbox show. But uh, he, he was with the Capitals. Capitals, okay. And then the Predators before that. All right, I know I'd seen him around. <laughs> Let's put it that way. a long time. He's with their, and he is with the Rangers, and they are, I think, the best team. They're the number one team, I believe, in terms of record uh, right now in, in the National Hockey League. That much we know, and, and that was great. That was classic stuff with the Devils the other night. I love it when they drop the gloves. Uh, eight guys were suspended of the ten that were on the ice. What happened with the other two? What were they just? They thought they were dancing with the stars? What the fuck? They should have been throwing some punches, man. Even a goalie should have been. Imagine that if the goalies got into it also and uh, all 12 players that uh, started out that were on the ice for the opening faceoff were rejected from the game before it was two seconds old. That, now that's classic. That That's regular season NHL hockey. <laughs> where somebody has a debt to pay for those hits by this rookie, Rempe, who apparently had uh, uh, inaugurated, initiated uh, the, this war uh, between the two clubs uh, with a couple of uh, hits that... Uh, the devil's considered uh, taking exception with. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. They, they more than how, how great is that though? I mean, uh, did you ever have that where you were going to fight a guy and everybody was saying, "Okay, it's going to be Luby and uh, you know." Oh, like in the schoolyard? No. Nah, yeah, no. in the schoolyard after school, it's Luby and Schwartz. They're, they're going to go at it today. No. No. And the whole school was talking about it all day long. They couldn't wait for you guys to get there, and then uh, everybody circles around while you get in the middle and, and you duke it out with somebody. No, have you no, ever no. had one of those I'm situations? I, we had friends involved in those. Those were always the best where it would be like by the bike rack. That was like our thing, but okay. I never myself. I, I mean, look at me. I was always little. Like I wasn't going to, and I wasn't a but shit. Now you were the kind of guy maybe that got picked on a little bit uh, because of that. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, what was the voice? Uh, voice similar characteristics. Really and glasses, and I, I, I did talk a lot, but I didn't talk a lot of shit. Like I, I've never been in a fight. See, like if you were in fifties, Brooklyn, Maybe yeah. or, or maybe even uh, early 60s Long Island, some asshole would have said, hey, you know what would be good? Why don't we get the biggest nerd and have him fight Lubitz? Yeah, I, I see who wins. And then all day we'll speculate that Luby can't beat this guy <laughs> that everybody can beat the shit out of. Probably. <laughs> and now if you don't beat the shit out of him, which you have no desire to do, I mean, yeah. there, there's no reason for you to have even uh, the slightest bit of uh, acrimony towards this guy. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and you look like an ass. And if you punk out, Yes. Yeah. You're in a shitty situation. Yeah. I never had that. There was enough people that liked fighting <laughs> that I, I was never one of them. No, yes, I, I'm very aware of those situations. Yes. And uh, it is funny that you see that in hockey from time to time and baseball once in a while. But it's like- great. Yeah. I mean, they had to be walking around all day. I mean, even a couple of days prior to the game, e- even weeks prior saying, hey, <laughs> second we get these assholes on the ice, man, we're dropping the gloves. <laughs> How great is that? But the uh, indignity suffered in our business, uh, Luby, I, I think surpasses anything that uh, happened to Gerard Gallant. And, and that's saying a lot, isn't it? And, and, and I brought this up because of the passing of young Ron, which uh, no one, no one, this is a, it was on TV. I saw, I mean, uh, would, would we, if I checked out Luby, would there be an item on the local news about that? Or uh, is it too far past my, I don't know, baby. I mean, you, my you main presence long, here in town. You've done it a long time. You did do some TV. I, Sportscaster Jeff DeForest, longtime radio guy, checked out yesterday at the age of whatever. I mean, uh, we'll make, between Mayo and Segreto and Vistramama, I'm sure we'll make sure of it. But I don't know, outside of us, I would think, yeah. Uh, but I mean, to make the Channel 10 news, even though I have I no familiarity with most of those people now. I'm out of touch with them. I feel like it would. But yeah, so when, uh, when young Ron passed, it actually was like all over the place. It made the news, yeah, yeah. Because uh, people were asking, hey, who said he died? Yeah, yeah no, nobody believed it. <laughs> and, and nobody would know anyway. I mean, you know what? I, the guy was a kind of a quiet, reclusive sort, was he not? He didn't really spend a lot of time around the radio station talking to anybody, did he? In fact, I, I don't even know. He could have been Harpo fucking Marks to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we met him eventually, but yeah, he nice was- enough. He he would sort of acknowledge that that you were walking by, but uh, he didn't have a lot to say. Castronova, on the other hand, you know, is a very gregarious sort, uh, always went ready to engage in conversation. Uh, young Ron was a bit of a mystery, was he not? It's funny. He's one of the because there are people that a lot of the time, like whoever, like at least like when you meet people from on air, and yeah, most of the time they are who they are, but there sure. are some sorts where they literally are putting on a character, which I still find <coughs> They put on a character, even though almost like- Like Suds Coleman. Maybe. Acting. Yeah. They, yeah, I didn't know Rick and Suds, but they, they put on, like, on air, they're this fucking star. Yeah. 
and then off air. <laughs> oh, yeah. Neil Rogers was very much like that. They, they're like jerk offs yeah. almost off air with standoffishness. And Ron was like the fucking quintess. Like he would get into the station the same time I would get in. Yeah. And like people, I know who I am. I know I can be grumpy and this and that. I get it. In the morning, you're, morning. you're not in the best of moods. But I, <laughs> especially <laughs> people I see every day, I would at least say, hey, how you doing? Sure. They, whatever, especially the people that have been around a long time that I, 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 Told to yeah, respect. respect for the guy. He had a long run there on yeah. an FM station that uh, is not easy to accomplish. I would say, hey, and, and they would all, they, usually the people that are really respected would put on at least an air because they didn't want people to think this. Not yeah. young Ron. Like the two. But like, no, he, he just himself. looked like. Uh, he would walk by me, bump me out of the way, yeah. go inside. I'm like, what the fuck's wrong if, with If you me? were hit by a car and, uh, you know, at the edge of the front door of the station, he, he would walk over your body and say, I got to get on the air. I mean, God rest right. his soul. Like, I'm not trying to talk shit about the dead, but like that is literally because you and I would get in sometimes at the same time. We'd be like, what's wrong with that guy? <laughs> he didn't say much. I, I used to go on their show sometimes and uh, <laughs> Castanova would calm down. You weren't seeing any sign of young Ron hovering around the AM station uh, studios. But uh, that being said, I, I, I don't know that I've ever seen anything uh, quite as indignant as this. And, I, you know, I, I went through my share of stuff uh, that nobody was in that business uh, for like 40 plus years that didn't at least get fired from one job. Right. So uh, you know what it feels like. And uh, anyway, it, it was, it was just so weird. I, mean, I don't know. If, were you in the parking lot with me when, when yeah, this yeah, happened, yeah. Luby? We went in, in the morning yeah. and it said, well, I don't remember what the show was called. Paul and young Ron or whatever the fuck the show was called. Paul and young Ron. And then we, we left at second building to Castanova. The news had never hadn't dropped. That's what's great about the radio news. Like yeah. it's not like you hear about it in advance. People know, like they don't tell you anything. You just like, oh no, it's the weirdest shit. We'll let you know that something happened. We walked down the end, and we we're like, Henry, what are you doing? And he was like spray painting. He, he had a can of Krylon, and, and the guy, his car wasn't even out of the parking lot yet. Young Ron, he hadn't actually left the facility officially. Uh, he was out of the building. And they were already with Krylon painting over Young Ron on the company vehicle. They had like a van that was like the Paul. That had the uh, big 105, uh, you know, what, what is that called? Where you, uh, you know, you stoop up the vehicle, vehicle there. The promotional yeah. vehicle. And it was like they decorate the shit out of it. And all yeah. That. <laughs> it was like. And, and a giant picture just Krylon over. <laughs> and it just said uh, the Paul show. <laughs> and that's not with, with a big Paul space is. between Paul and show. <laughs> where where young Ron and young Ron used to be, man. It's That's so fucked great. up. I'm sorry. It's so great. <laughs> they couldn't wait a day for that. I mean, uh, the guy literally wasn't even out of the parking lot. Like. Oh, All right, uh, let's get into it. We got a lot of stuff to uh, get into, but uh, yeah, that's as indignant as it gets. And uh, so uh, we salute him as he, he checks out. Uh, I wouldn't know where where he was uh, at this point. Was he one of those guys that went back to like Ohio or something? Uh, with oh, his retirement yeah. money? Because he, he walked out with a pile of cash. His ending was weird. Yeah. Uh, you, you never heard them talk about him. And that's one thing, like we talk about all the stuff off that's off the air on the air. Yeah. Like that was, that's one of those shows that's very like prefab. So like, I know it's a morning show, so I'm sure they have fun, but they also, I don't, I, I feel like whatever Castronovo said on the show was not <laughs> what happened. So, Possibly. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, the story about what happened. Yeah, there? Oh, what, no, it was, was clear cut. Than, <laughs> Scapegoat city. That was firing the hitting coach. Yeah. Wasn't it? It was uh, like, we're, uh, you know, the, the ratings <laughs> tank for one, uh, well, one uh, period, uh, you know, a quarter of a year. And next a new program director comes in and he goes, it's you. It's just old fart, man. Uh, this routine is old. Now, Paul, you want to keep your job? I, I got to get rid of your assistant coaches. I'm sorry. And uh, you can, I mean, at that point, so let's face it, Luby, when they tell me well, we got to get rid of Luby, I'm saying, well, that really sucks, but uh, best of luck. Yeah, yeah. yeah, as long as it doesn't involve me, I'm okay. No, no, I mean, well, what are you going to do? Walk out? The guy's going to walk out on a million dollar a year job? No way. No, no, no. It was just so, funny. The whole thing was funny. It's always funny with radio. Right over the uh, picture they painted with Krylon. <laughs> Not even like a, a paintbrush, just spray painted the guy right out of the uh, right out of the company. All right, uh, coming back with the professor here. The professor on the uh, final four, of course, and, and then uh, but we also have the women's games, which the semifinal games are tonight in Cleveland, Ohio, and there'll be a lot of fanfare about that. The world has gone with sugar now, hasn't it, Luby? Where uh, tickets for the women's games are twice the price of the men's games in Glendale, Arizona. Ken actually did explain it. I didn't think about this. Remember, we were there. They do the men's Final Fours in fucking stadiums. Yes. 
So you have 50,000. Oh, or that's right. Okay. That makes seats. sense. Yeah. The women's, they do not do it. <laughs> Even for Caitlin Clark, they're not doing it in a fucking stadium. They do it in an arena. Yeah. Uh, okay, makes it's sense. A small on the smaller side arena too. It's not even like one of these massive arenas. So that is all, all of the women's libbers are uh, you know waving a banner now, and uh, that that's their big thing that they're citing. So that turns out to be bullshit right. too. All right, very he's, good. He's Leave it right. to the professor to sniff that out like right away while he's we're sitting here. But well, like, how the fuck did that happen? I was giving them credit. He's like, yeah, I'm like, what what face? And he's like. Yeah, it's, I mean, the men play in a Makes fucking sense. stadium. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can have courtside seats and not be able to make out which, uh, you know, which team has the ball. Right? We were sitting, remember, we were sitting in the back behind a basket there, Louis. Can you really figure out what the fuck was going on on the court? No, nothing. All right, Professor, uh, we're going to come right back to you. Uh, how are you, by the way? How you doing, guys? Doing fine. All right. Uh, very good. Uh, the professor coming up with uh, some college basketball analysis and the big board as well. That's happening in a moment. Now that. The time. Crylon, man. That's unbelievable. It's uh, 8.35. Chris Segreto here. Let me ask you a question. What do you look for when you go out to eat? Good food, obviously. Friendly atmosphere. Not too loud, but good energy. Reasonable prices. And a place where you feel comfortable. All those ingredients, <laughs> no pun meant there, are hard to find unless you're talking about the Texas Roadhouse. You see, they encompass all of those attributes. Really, really good food, amazing atmosphere, good for a family, good for a date, or just a night out for yourself, and prices that will make you extremely happy. Their ribs unmatched, steaks hand cut every day, everything, and I mean everything is made on site, including their incredible bread. It's the one day, folks, that you can forget about low carb diets. Trust me when I tell you, Texas Roadhouse, your restaurant, your destination, when you say, where should we go and eat tonight? From the newly renovated sports bar to the beautiful bayside views captured at the Tiki Bar, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill has it all. Located at mile marker 104, the Big Chill also offers waterfront dining while experiencing breathtaking sunset views of the Florida Keys. It's simply the hottest spot in the Keys to cool off. That's Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill at mile marker 104 in Key Largo. For more information, call today at 305-453-9066. The professor's big board. The big board. How yeah, there we go. Who would be a better vice presidential pick than throw Rogan? Bill Mickelson. In the world, you have to deal with a lot of scumbags. You have to deal with a lot of nations. <laughs> that we find this tasteful. Uh, and guess what? Phil Mickelson's already in business with all of them. And let's yes. be honest, don't we want this in our vice president? Don't we want a guy who just <laughs> for no corrupt. reason yes. dresses like he's on his way to a Tijuana donkey show? <laughs> yeah. and does that socially <laughs> for no reason? Uh, don't we want a guy who looks like he has a collection of Girls Gone Wild videos all of them <laughs> in his house to be the vice president? <laughs> and it really, it doesn't matter. Whatever the worst country, whatever you think the worst country on the world is, yeah. Phil Nicholson has tried to do an NFT deal with them for yeah. the last two or three years. No doubt. Very it's good for the uh, expansion of gambling, too, in the United States if he becomes VP. Very vi again. This is Phil Mickelson. We, we want to fix inflation. We want to fix the economy. Uh, let's bet the future on the Rams for the Super Bowl. Very nice. All right. And so, Phil. Again, that just screams dignity really and vice presidential yeah. nature. Honestly, the only way to get your morning started is with Defo, joined by Luby, right here on the Defo Show. No better way to finish the week than uh, with a professor on a Degenerate Friday edition of the program. We welcome or back. Or getting uh, fired. One way or the other, you're good. <laughs> uh, we had trouble firing up virtually everything this morning. Uh, we, we got a little off track here. but uh, And I tried to log into another show before that and I couldn't. I was shut out. Uh, that was my own stupidity, as it turned out, which... Uh, from a technical standpoint, you won't find surprising. Um, how are you, Professor? Uh, this, I would imagine, uh, and and I, you would be the best uh, equipped to weigh in on, on uh, what level of interest uh, that uh, that's games uh, these games tonight should generate. Because normally we, we wouldn't even know that the women's actually, games are being actually. I'm probably played. the single worst source. Yeah, he's there's, actually not caring. There's <laughs> no way in hell I saw 12 million coming for. Uh, yeah. The, I would say honestly. With LSU gone, because I again, um, I, I come from a background of you know boxing and wrestling and everything else when I was a kid. I think you have to have both elements of the story. You have to have both the hero and the villain. 
And, you know, uh, again, shout out to our man, Blake, who uh, was uh, recording with the WWE uh, up in uh, New York this week for oh, uh, for NF- yeah. NXT as, as WrestleMania gets close. Anyway, uh, as great as Hulk Hogan was, as much as Hulk Hogan was the 1980s, without Roddy Piper, Hulk Hogan is not quite Hulk Hogan, not the one yeah. we know anyway. So I feel like in terms of ratings numbers, LSU was Roddy Piper. I actually yeah. think the, the final four numbers might be slightly down uh, from what we saw Monday night. Um, not hugely. I mean, if it was 12, maybe we're talking like 11, 11, five. Uh, and then Sunday for South, if it's South Carolina, Sunday, South Carolina and Iowa, uh, I, maybe they flirt with that 12 number again. If it's uh, South Carolina and Connecticut, it's probably like four. And oh, yeah. Wow. That much uh, different Carolina yeah, state. Rid of her. And if it's North Carolina state and Connecticut, it's like 83,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim Sarney will be one of them. Our, our good friend Sarney uh, man, uh, wouldn't miss this for again, a second. If you dig this, that's cool. It's just not my thing. Yeah. But I know Monday night they roped me in because, again, <laughs> you had not just the hero, but you had the hero and the villain. I, of course, was cheering for the villain because that's just the kind of guy yes. I am. Um, but uh yeah I, I i actually think that might be the peak would be my personal guess but we'll see i, I mean plus the fact friday nights versus a work night i mean a lot of people like to go out yeah excuse me a lot of people like to go out on a friday night so we'll see i would guess a little bit down but not sure and then again you get the surprise on the men's game because like when they broke the story that the women did 12-3 that's one thing but when they did the story that uh Duke and NC State did 15 on a Sunday, on an Easter Sunday, in the middle of dinner. I was uh, a little shocked by that number. I, but, again, credit to, you know, CBS and TBS and uh, the people who have paid the uh, ratings fees through the years. Uh, apparently, the basketball tournament this year absolutely threw the roof, which leads to the side question of uh, why NBA ratings have been consistently down when America has shown it really does enjoy – the sport of basketball as a, a television event. And I don't really necessarily have, I know people say it's like a political thing. It's, you know, like back in the Kaepernick days that the NBA has gone too woke and whatever. I don't necessarily buy that. I, I don't know exactly what it is with the NBA and ratings, but you know, it, it seems odd given the uh, explosion for the tournament this year. Yeah, I, I mean, you could attribute it to a lot of things, uh, not the least of which would be uh, that the NBA players and, and teams themselves have sort of convinced you over the last you know, decade and change uh, anyway that uh, the regular season uh, doesn't mean a whole lot to them. Now, now, now they've done they've done some things which I normally would have been opposed to, Professor. Uh, I am never a big fan of expansion of playoffs in, in any sport, but uh, I think both in baseball and basketball, it actually has enhanced the importance of even very late regular season games. For, I'm inclined for, to I'm inclined to agree, but it, again, it hasn't shown up in the television. Yeah. Yeah. And let's be honest, the the events themselves, the expanded playoffs themselves, are freaking awful, and nobody watches it. Like, yeah. I'm a Heat fan, and I didn't watch that second play in game last week. Like, <laughs> yeah, and and. and you know, then all of a sudden you started to see, uh, oh, yeah, shoot, the heat are down here. They're about to get knocked out of the playoffs <laughs> altogether. And as the old adage went, uh, going back, I can still remember my Uncle Joey telling me this when I was a little kid uh, and we were watching NBA basketball. And he said, uh, nothing matters until the final four minutes in the NBA. And uh, that, that still sort of persists uh, as, as something that you're going to abide by. It's funny. If you remember... Uh with like a week or maybe 10 days left in the NBA regular season, uh, there was a chance last year that the Heat could miss even the the play-in game. Yeah. And I remember very specifically having the conversation with Luby, like maybe we should tank these games and get into the lottery. And Luby was like, well, you know, it's 14 million to one or whatever that they'd, they'd win the lottery and get, get Wemby. And I was like, might be worth it. Yeah. It might be worth it uh, to buy that particular lottery ticket. Uh, and then, of course, they go on a run to the finals. So I guess you never know. Uh, didn't feel it feels felt like you kind of do know this year after watching that game last night, uh, because when night after night, Terry Rozier is your best player. 
Yes. Does it, does it feel like this is going to be the year? But we'll find out. Yeah, they're in there with a shot. I mean, uh, you, you would have to say. Uh, Boston, uh, clearly, I, you know, this is probably make you cringe. But, uh, I mean, clearly has uh, posted the best record. Uh, they're going to have the best record in the NBA. And, and they played well. I, I, I don't. You know, that, I mean, that doesn't mean squat to me. It's a team full of losers and jokers. Yeah, right. <laughs> I didn't want to dwell on that too much. Uh, Again. Uh, but the rest of the pack, I mean, uh, you, you could Again, literally throw United a blanket States, over them. United States was like 182 all time against Angola until Jason Tatum showed up on the team. And then <laughs> immediately <laughs> lost. <laughs> Loser. <laughs> Losing mofo. I, the guy went to Duke. Did he ever get past the round of 32 in a in a in the tournament he is a stone loser if i've ever seen one in my entire life I, honestly I, he went to duke did he ever get to the sweet 16 i i, I think so i don't know I'm not i mean again he, 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 is, freshman, he won't so. be getting your mvp ballot then uh, professor this year <laughs> I, 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 that is honestly the biggest joke in all <laughs> of nba nonsense of these idiots from you know Bob Ryan's bastard children who have spread out throughout the, uh, <laughs> the incredible. Are you kidding me? What it would honestly? What is Jason Tatum like? Maybe the the seventh or eighth best player in the NBA. The fact that anybody wants to vote him for MVP is a complete freaking joke. I mean, honestly, he wouldn't. He shouldn't be in the same conversation. Joker should be insulted that he's in the same conversation. <laughs> Joker is so much better than I think one of Joker's harness horses. <laughs> is probably beat him in the game of one on one. That's how much better Jokic is. You would take Novak Djokovic uh, if you were betting a one on one game with Jason Tatum. Uh, yes, uh, just right. because the names are so close. But yes, <laughs> um, no, I don't think there's necessarily a clear cut favorite. I think uh, Milwaukee, obviously, more clear cut. I mean, more built for the playoffs in terms of personnel uh, than the Boston. And again, we saw it last year. The Boston Celtics. You almost got swept by a team that was in the playoff play-in game. You got three games where the Heat let you back in just to mess with you, and then you they went to your court and beat you by forty <laughs> with Jimmy Butler not playing a good series. Like, yeah. I, like why would I be afraid of the Boston Celtics? <laughs> that, that's ridiculous. The, 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 the proposition is stupid. Oh. <laughs> but this year we got Christian Kristaps Porzingis. Oh, great! A guy whose bones bones are made of tinker toys. <laughs> <laughs> Not even balsa wood. Tinker toy. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Professor, what do you think about the? Uh... The men's games, I guess. Let's zero in on that. Uh, I, you know, again, I think the best play angle for <laughs> this round is probably the one we talked about uh, the other day, which yeah. is take yeah. Alabama on a light shot, like a like a quarter unit on the money line at five to one, uh, and then come back and take UConn at a full unit at uh, minus eleven and a half. Because I still still see that game the same way. It's going to go one of two ways: either UConn is going to just crush them like a grape. Or Alabama is going to win the game straight up. I don't see really room for any middle ground. Do we have a, a model for Alabama to do that? We do. The Creighton game. Um, UConn, their one Achilles heel is they don't defend the three-point line very well. And Alabama, I mean, we've seen it. They, they are going to play their way and do their thing. They shoot the three well, and they shoot them in the really almost unheard of volume. volume. We've seen very few teams – uh, who play like this over the base. You kind of got to go back to like a Loyola Marymount who's this insistent in shooting uh, this percentage of uh, the three-point shot and the offensive rebound. So that's, uh, you know, they're going to do their thing and hope it works. I don't think they'll stop UConn at all on on, on the uh, offensive end of the court. That's another angle I think you could take in this game, even though the, the total's high uh, at 160. But for, you know, those who know, uh, the, the very common trend over the years is when the number looks too high, take the over anyway. When the number looks too low, go under anyway. This comes in at uh, 160 is very high. wouldn't be surprised to me if this game went well over uh, and the game was played in the high 80s, maybe even the, the 90s uh, on one side. Other game, Purdue and NC State. I, again, I'm with everybody else in America. I am rooting for DJ Burns, but I don't see it happening. Um I don't see how he's going to match up with Edie at all. And again, when the Purdue shooters are on, Purdue is a very good 
overall offensive team, and they're they're good at playing in the half court, which is their comfort zone. Um, nine and a half, I don't know. It's a big number for a team uh, in Purdue that does is very comfortable playing uh, end to end basketball. They're very comfortable walking the ball up and just pitching it into the to the shave jetty and uh, <laughs> letting him do his thing even late in the shot clock. Well, I mean, you know, you saw that a lot in Tennessee, even at the end of the shot clock. They're comfortable with throwing Edie an initial post at like six seconds, letting yes. him kick out, repost, go back to him, and get a shot up with like a second or two. They're, they're very comfortable with playing that style of offense. Um, so nine and a half kind of looks like a big number there to me, but I'm not inclined to take the points. Uh, again, I would sort of do the, the ping pong. High number with Alabama and uh, UConn at 160 go – over anyway, relatively low number with NC State and Purdue, I think 143, something like that. Uh, <coughs> be afraid to go under there because Purdue may just choose to to walk the ball up this entire game. The difference, again, in that number would be if the Purdue three-point shooters are hitting. And, and again, I say that like it's regular for them to shoot poorly like they did in like <laughs> Tennessee. It is not regular. So, uh, three of their guards shoot over 44% from uh, – uh, three point range, and the other one, Jones, made the most and is the probably the clutchest shooter of all of them. And I think he still comes in at like 39%. He's an exceptional shooter, uh, in his own right. It's just the other three are, are so unusually good at it. Um, so that's the way I would look at it. Primary play Alabama money line combined with UConn minus the 11 and a half, obviously in different amounts. So you'd take like I don't know, a hundred dollars on Alabama and the money line at five to one, and then four hundred dollars. On UConn, and you're trying to edge out the margins uh, there, and then um, come back with the over in that game, and then probably the under in NC State and Purdue. Light action, keep the powder dry, as we like to say during football, and be ready for uh, UConn and Purdue uh, a big matchup uh, in the final game. Where mm -hmm. if we don't talk about it Monday, uh, if that ends up the matchup. I would be inclined to probably lean a little bit to the Purdue side. Wow. Uh, I think they match up very well. Again, the only U Achilles Hill UConn has is they do not defend the three-point line pretty particularly well, and mm -hmm. that is something Purdue is exceptional at. All right, interesting. Uh, the and, uh, Honestly, the other thing is if you watch the spreads, the public is hugely biased towards Purdue uh, UConn right mm -hmm. now. Uh, the way you, like you rarely see in professional sports, it's like a, you know, in, in the peak days of Saban when you're always laying like an extra three or four points with sure. Alabama, you got that going on right now with 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 good but reason. But they've been covering right, yeah, yeah with good reason because they've been crushing everybody's head for yeah. two years. But they've also got a series of matchups that sort of fell well into their lap <laughs> for the last two years, whereas not so much in a theoretical. I I think. They kind of did with Alabama, too, which is why we have an 11-and-a-half point game in the Final Four. Um, but I don't think that would be the case with Purdue. I Some of the initial numbers I saw uh, indicated UConn by like four-and-a-half or five, if that were the mm -hmm. theoretical matchup. I think that's too many points, and I wouldn't be – I would actually be focusing on Purdue on the money line in that situation because I think if that's a matchup, there'll be an excellent chance for Purdue to win a game, uh, assuming there's no injuries uh, in this round. All right, Professor, ladies and gentlemen, on the uh, final four. All right, let's get into it. And if you're uh, going to ask me about the girls, I have no idea what. No, happened. no, we, we're going to we're going to. I've literally right seen that. Iowa play once, and I've seen the other yeah. teams play a combined zero times. So. It seems like nobody's <laughs> discussing no the fact that uh, <laughs> South Carolina hasn't lost a game this year, and uh, seems like because they did it last year and yeah. then they lost, right? Right, right. That, I mean, and, and know, in a position though, uh, where, where they, they they have the easy uh, path of least resistance to the final here uh, among the I mean, uh, teams that are going to play. Isn't everybody the easy path to? I mean, that, that, yeah, but uh, I mean, NC State. Uh, I, I don't know that they were uh, that that highly regarded as a women's team. Uh, they're making. I, I'm assuming a little bit of a Cinderella run uh, in, in the tournament as well. They're the three seed, right? Uh, maybe, yeah. I don't know. I mean, but uh, they weren't like one of these teams oh, that I, you heard I, a lot I, about all year I, long. Yeah, yeah. I, I get that. I'm just, yeah. uh, you know. All right, all right uh, Big Born, uh, are, are we? Yes, okay. Yes. And as you can see. Go final for title, yourself. Yeah. We are bringing <laughs> back one of the classics, uh, one of the early Big Boards. Yes. Which is the Big Board of Go Final for Yourself 2024. For those who have been watching for a while, who will remember the initial big board a couple of years ago, uh, we did go final for yourself. So we're doing this year's edition, the go final for yourself, 2024, talking about the important stories of the final four, 
uh, including this week, where I find this whole story particularly bizarre. Uh, but number five, Rich Eisen gets yelled at <laughs> by America for fat shaming DJ Burns. Isn't what we like about DJ Burns is that he's oh, fat? Like that. Yes. Was my, I will say now. First of all, the one thing I will say: the fact of all the people at ESPN uh, from back like 10, 15 years ago, the one who has like a surviving brand is Rich Ivan. Eisen is the most bizarre thing in the That's world. Weird. Yeah, yeah. When he was at ESPN, he was far and away the least talented one. He was the one. <laughs> <laughs> he was the one who clearly had been meant to be like a weatherman in Akron. And just yes. somehow ended up on the sports desks calling high school games on Thursday nights for some reason. <laughs> and has parlayed this, I guess, because he was the one who was smart enough to go with the NFL, who saw that the NFL network was the way to go. Yeah. And at that point, the NFL network had tried to hire, like, you know, Craig Kilborn, everyone, yep. Overman, all the talented people from ESPN. And they had all said no. And Rich Eisen was like, well, eventually I'm going to be doing weather. And Akron again, <laughs> being the fourth best person at ESPN. So I will go with the NFL Network, and it's hugely profited from that decision. So great yep. job, but it is weird that we've gotten to 2024, and that one of like I don't know two, maybe three radio slash television sports shows that still have any influence. Rich Eisen hosts one of them. Yeah, I'm because I see Rich Eisen stories all the time. I know he's still doing a radio show. I can't remember the last time I heard someone talk about. It what happened on the Dan Patrick radio show. I have a feeling that Dan Patrick could beat his wife on the radio show. And it still <laughs> would not make the news somehow. But Rich Eisen <laughs> casually asks DJ Burns about his weight, and America loses its shit about it. They're like, oh, <laughs> he's fat-shaming DJ Burns. He's not fat-shaming DJ you Burns. DJ Burns? We all love DJ Burns because <laughs> DJ Burns. Is. If DJ Burns looked like Carl Malone, we would not give a a uh, shit about DJ. Yeah. <laughs> He's DJ Pascal Burns Siakam. Up sure. With, you know, muscles everywhere. And it was just like a yeah, six like foot nine, 225 <laughs> cut up dude. It looked like you're going to pro wrestling. We were like, yeah, you're going to get buried by Edie. Nobody gives a shit. But because he's fat, we want to see him go up and conquer Zach. Eady. So let's not pretend <laughs> that part of the appeal of DJ Burns is not that he's a big fat dude. I mean, come on. She's totally. This appeal. is what we love about him. I mean, so the only yeah. reason I, I even started noticing him, uh, yeah, and that was during the regular season. I'm like, who is this guy, man? This fat guy. He looks like the kind of guy that shows up at the park. You're not expecting much from him, and it turns out he has like marvelous basketball instincts yes. and. <laughs> It he carries has, you to a, a run where you hold the court from uh, 8 o'clock at night all the way through uh, when they turn the lights out at midnight. He has, as they say, old man game. Yes. yes. And yes, he does. Again, I, there's nothing wrong with that. Every successful fat player ever has basically had, except Barkley, yes. who somehow could be 75 pounds overweight and still the most explosive dude. Right. On the yeah. Yeah. But, but if you look at old clips of Barkley, uh, even though he was he uh, you know true. deemed the round mount of rebound, I mean, that, the guy's felt by comparison to a lot of people today. Uh, not when he first came in the league. Barkley was legit fat his yeah. first couple of years. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I see some highlights of him, and I'm like, uh, wait a minute, the guy, the guy looks Oh, no, as he progressed long, he got... It's his son's days. His as he progressed long, he got... To the Suns days, he obviously, you know, got a trainer and a nutritionist yeah. and all of that. And he actually got not just felt, but like, you know, super yeah. athletic. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he looked great. But like those, those first couple of years in the NBA, clearly the combination of unlimited access to money and unlimited access to food uh, did not Jesus. necessarily <laughs> serve Charles Barkley well. Translate into a uh, strong physical presence. Um, no, we, we love the guy because he's fat. There, there's no he's doubt fat. about it. That, that's yeah. the reason I noticed him. And, uh, you know, you started to really just you fall in love with his name. You can't shame a guy if what you love about him is the fat yeah. that he's fat. It's like fat shaming Jared Lorenzen. Yeah, it's like <laughs> fat. No, it's like fat shaming Curly from the Three Stooges. <laughs> <laughs> Curly from the Three Stooges were like some skinny bald dude. We'd be like, oh, he looks yeah. sick. That doesn't look fat. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody in America's favorite entertainment. Like you didn't love Jackie Gleason because he was svelte. I mean, you love exactly. Him. Yeah. Some uh, fat guys love America fat just guy. love because they're fat guys, and DJ Burns is one of them. Look at us with our rare golfer that we uh, absolutely oh, uh, right. adored there, Kiradesh Afi Barnrat. Hey, or, or John Daly before him. Daly, Daly before him. Uh, was Again, classic. we love the fat athlete. Always love the fat guy. All right, uh, that's number five. We Number love him four. because he's fat. 
<laughs> so tired of no, UConn no, fans no. and Donner, Don, I don't know, Danny Hurley turning everything into a goddamn conspiracy. First, it was the draw. Then it was somehow who advanced was part of some NCAA conspiracy. Now, because their plane gets delayed a few hours, you have UConn fans actively whining that the NCAA, for some reason, left their plane on the tarmac in Connecticut until uh, 1.30 in the morning. They didn't arrive in Phoenix uh, until 6.30 uh, Eastern time, 3.30 local time. They're complaining about their REM cycle. <laughs> and uh, you people, people stop whining. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I am so <laughs> tired of the Hurley family and the entire state of Connecticut. You fucking cry babies. Shut up. <laughs> did, did you have a particularly bad experience in the Northeast? Maybe in this or a previous <laughs> life? In New York. That's a funny thing. He's actually what, what, do you, what do you mean? I don't know. I mean, uh, between mean? Boston, Connecticut. Yes, what do you mean? Yeah. Yes, you know, you know what my problem is? They hire people like Danny Hurley. That's. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, how much more could life just throw you a multi million yeah. dollar career into your lap, and you yeah. are a gigantic fucking crybaby? I remember <laughs> when we were doing the Broward County High School game of the week. He went to. He was a coach in New Jersey. For the Catholic school, that it only hired him because his father has had a been the that. dominant other Catholic school, and he had Tristan fucking Thompson on his team, and then he kicked Tristan Thompson off the team. So Tristan Thompson went off to some one of those basketball factories uh, because he didn't like the way he had rebounded in the second half of a game. They were up forty. Like <laughs> honestly, how much more could life throw you lottery ticket after lottery ticket, and you're a fucking crybaby? I'm sorry, you were. Born into a yeah, coaching dynasty legacy. Yep. Your brother was such a good basketball player. There was no fucking pressure on you to be a good basketball player. Yeah. You could be the scrub for seat in the hall. <laughs> Nobody gave you because you were never any good anyway. It was your older brother that actually got playing pressure. And then they just started giving you coaching jobs because, hey, you know, his dad was really good at it, so he'll be. And the whole time, you would be like, ooh, life is so hard. <laughs> get me. The opposing fans at Creighton say mean stuff to me. <laughs> and, they, and then they give you the UConn job. Yeah. After they, they fired Kevin Ali, who won a uh, Kevin Ali. Ali, yeah. Kevin Ali won a, I, I don't know, I did the Luby thing. I always do the really impression. That. They fired uh, Kevin Ali after he wins a national title and they give the job to you. And again, it's a, it's a legacy job. How much more? I mean, who who got a better deal than uh Danny freaking <laughs> early? And like honestly, who inherited more shit ever? There, there are members of the Walton fans who are like that fucking Danny Hurley. What the <laughs> Hurley and Yukon fans go full Alex Jones. Yeah. yeah. In the back yeah, it's a freaking conspiracy. Your plane got delayed on yeah. a day where like ten thousand yes. flights across the country got delayed, and you're trying to make it into a for oh the, the world is out to get us. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm with Saturday. you. Right? I'm like, I'm like, they were making this a story. What was it, Wednesday? I'm like, who they play Saturday? I'm like, how many days do they need to be in fucking Arizona? How many, <laughs> how many games in a row do you have to convince these idiots that the world is out, uh, out for, out for us? Yeah, like, why is that always got to be a thing? Alabama money line. Let's let, let's all Show up that. Yes. basketball. All right, that's number four. <laughs> Hurley and UConn fans go full Alex Jones. All a conspiracy against him. Nice. Number three. This is, of course, a picture that went viral on the internet. This is Zach Eady <laughs> okay. partying in the dorms at Purdue, which, number one, let's point out, this is a normal-sized dorm. Oh, so geez. I assume it. Look how he has to hunch over to get through how his dorm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sucks. Number two, apparently this girl, they have not revealed her name, but apparently this girl is a player on the Purdue women's team and is six foot one. Look oh, at God. how he makes normal-sized people. <laughs> Imagine that, yeah. What if he's with a girl 5'2"? Awesome. Oh, my God. But, like, I, here's my question. If you're Zach Eady's size, does everything feel like child molesting? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. what woman do you have to yeah. hook up with to not feel like a complete creep? Yeah. Because, like, everything, it's, I mean, it, it, no, it, looks no. like, it looks like me and a 12-year-old. <laughs> How's the weather up there? I bet he's heard that. Yeah, a few look times. at that. That's crazy. She's yeah. six one. Six one's tall for a woman. Like, six one's huge. For six a woman. one. Yeah, six yeah. Like you're like this with her. player for a woman. Again, poor Zach Eady. Like he can't date a a, a woman. He's got to go to the circus to find a girl. <laughs> <laughs> 
And they want to deny him a championship. I, I don't know. Maybe they, uh, you know, funny. all of this stuff uh, will uh, surface and he plays a dynamite game there and he knocks off UConn, which would be great. But again, uh, I hope this young woman in this case knew what size ride she's signing up for. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, the other question Jack comes into play. It's not like it would be a fun evening to me. <laughs> does this size, uh, you know, equate out another, you know. <laughs> and it's even relatively proportional. How does the size play out? Not uh, well. I mean, are, we, are we talking Daryl Dawkins here? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think we're talking He's blue doing... whales here. <laughs> you're talking Mandingo at this point. I mean. <laughs> Make a horse. <laughs> Holy shit, yeah. That, that was Again, an aspect of the game we haven't seen in Ellis. Yeah, this is good. <laughs> As, you, won't, as, you won't hear. Uh, as Andy points out, as Andy points out, this girl has been the tallest person in the room her entire life. Like when she was in the fourth grade, she was the one who was a yeah. head and a half taller than everybody else. And now again, it looks like a guy approaching a four, uh, an eight-year-old to ask if she wants some candy. Yes. <laughs> Can you uh, forward this to Iron Eagle somehow? Because yes. uh, he's going to be doing a game. Uh, he might want to bring this up. <laughs> should reference it. I, uh, I don't uh, think Iron Eagle wants to do this. Psychological makeup. His first final four. <laughs> Zach Eadie's contending with. Yeah, his first final four. That's it. Yeah, Nance Zach comes Eadie back. He's a big dude. I wonder if he's big everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think the better question is, is like, can you be seven foot four a, and first round draft pick? Uh, the superstar of your team, the superstar of the season, and it's possible you still never get laid just because you scared the hell <laughs> scared of out me. of every woman who enters your room. Yeah. It's no, a strong that possibility, would be, honestly, man. Yeah. That would be a bitch of a life to be a superstar college athlete who still can't ever Tim get Tebow. a yeah. Tim Tebow. Yeah. That 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 about, a, a Tim Tebow, but uh, at the University of Florida, no less. I mean, uh, this guy's at Purdue. I don't know what the but Tim Tebow, not by choice. Tim not Tebow his choice. Chose to be that way. They like run from yeah, him. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. No. Well, that's a different game altogether. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you remember, I like Miss Universe is hitting on him in the quad yeah, well, again, there at the every, University of Florida. Remember, there were pictures all the time. Like every piece at the wide. University of Florida was dying to get uh, into. Their oh home my God! Yeah, they don't want to convert them. You know, we're at the age now where uh, you know that that's what's going on there on the college campuses. I mean, if they find a virgin of that stature, <laughs> my God, <laughs> your mission that, would be to make sure that he got laid. Uh, that, that's for sure. And that right, takes uh, us to our number two story, which yeah. is easily for me the weirdest and most uncomfortable angle to this Final Four. Uh, and it goes back a few years ago. I don't know if you remember, but when uh, Auburn made the Final Four against uh, the University of Virginia yeah. a couple of years back, they started to try Bruce Pearl, who had been his whole life the biggest scumbag in the room, no matter <laughs> where he was. Bruce Pearl could have been, uh, you know, hanging out with Bernie Madoff, and Bruce Pearl was still somehow a more morally <laughs> reprehensible sack of shit. And they tried to turn him into this feel-good story because he had turned yes. around yes. Auburn basketball, and that takes us to Nate Oates. Yes, coach yes. everybody loves in Alabama basketball. Yes. The feel good story. Our motto yeah. around here for right. Alabama basketball 24 before okay. roll tide 24. No more murders, no more bringing guns to shoot single mothers. Just good basketball. There you go. <laughs> exactly. They cleaned it all up uh, under Nate Oates. See, he had an epiphany. Again, let's remember Nate Oates last year was letting them do the pat down celebration. Yes, yes, on Brandon Miller. In the last game of the season, yes. again, after Brandon Miller spent the entire season possibly getting ready to be charged with accessory to murder because he brought a gun to a teammate who used it to murder a single mother. And now one year later, they're the feel good store. I feel I mean, I don't I don't know how much more uh, you can turn this around uh, much more quickly than Alabama basketball. 2020. Uh, I mean, they must be using Nick Saban's PR uh, people. <laughs> no? I feel like even Nick Saban's PR people are like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, if Nick had, was... Like, Nick know, did some bad shit, but he never murdered a single mother. I mean... <laughs> no, or acknowledged... I mean, we had, some, uh, I mean, we had yeah. the kid who was dealing weed to all his teammates, but yes. it wasn't murder. Like, yeah, and to condone this uh, behavior or even uh, suggest that uh, you, know, you can find some humor in it is uh, is a little bit bizarre. For a coach, I mean, you know, the guy is supposed to be it. the example. Uh, we should yeah. bring this up with Tony Segreto, uh, uh, what it's like. Nate Oates, he's a very good a man. growing young man. Uh, again, he's, he's, a, yes. he's a leader yes. of young men and inspiration yeah. 
who teaches him not to be just great at basketball, but <laughs> great at life. <laughs> there you go, man. These guys, not all of them are going to be pros. You know, yeah, the exactly. Old there yeah. are tens of thousands of NCAA athletes, and not all of them are going pro in sports. <laughs> Correct, because at the University of Alabama basketball program, some of them are going pro in, I don't know, crime, weapons <laughs> distributorship. <laughs> Arms Pretty sad uh, state like, of affairs, yeah. I, 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 it's amazing. Yeah. I, forward that to Eagle also, see if I'll yes. allude to that. Uh, <laughs> just a year ago, this is where yeah. we were at. Exactly. <laughs> just a year ago, <laughs> year we talked around, about man. Alabama basketball. Well, yeah. They were a better yeah. seed, by the way, heads yes, into the one. tournament. Uh, the first thing on your mind was the murder of a single mother. Yeah. No, but, you know, this year, again, no guns, no single mother murders, what just growth. good basketball. What growth. Yeah, you know, it's good. Uh, you know, you love to see this uh, with, with uh, young, <laughs> academically inclined uh, individuals. Uh, all right, uh, number one, then. This and is, it uh, takes be us quite to number unveiled. one, which was uh, a big revelation to me yesterday. Because mm -hmm. I, you know, I again, I watched the game Monday, uh, and it's a, I've never been at this end of the gender. Um, but I got to say, Clay, Caitlin Clark revealed something to me. After being honest, she was so good on the court uh, Monday night. But now... You are a totally unperformed <laughs> garbage, Caitlin Clark. Delighted in Cleveland. So go to say for like five straight minutes how much you love the Cle city of Cleveland. You are so full of shit, your eyes are brown. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you you want to convince me of a lot of things, sure, but don't convince. Try to sell me. What are you you're trying to get work? For, <laughs> trying to get some nil money out of the city of Cleveland's yeah. tourism board? Probably got paid for that. Commerce. Give me nobody likes Cle and somebody actually pointed out. Well, she's from Iowa. She may not know any better. I yes. feel like everybody, the minute they enter Cleveland, knows better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could spend a whole week in Cleveland and still have thousands and thousands of things to do. What? What could you do <laughs> after being in Cleveland for a week, other than possibly, I don't know, pick up a meth habit? <laughs> <laughs> How many, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. How many friend. graffiti murals of LeBron exactly. James can you exactly. see in a lifetime? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, after a week in Cleveland, do you just instantly start wearing that stupid Indian's head around to show that you're a dedicated <laughs> racist in 2024? Like, well, honestly, what is it that makes Cleveland that appeal? Don't, if you're going to try to bullshit me like that, then, then make the bullshit more detail rich. Just, <laughs> not, oh, this is such a great city. I'm so happy and excited to be here. We had such a good time going around the city. It's Cleveland. Nobody's ever said that about Cleveland. <laughs> you, Caitlin Clark, are not only a chucker, you are a freaking liar and a really bad one at that, too. Because literally <laughs> nobody has ever said that. Bernie Kosar wouldn't say that about Cleveland. <laughs> Put him at the wrong time. LeBron's kids are like, oh no, Cleveland. Cleveland, so get out of here. Not going there. You know, we couldn't wait to get out of there. Yeah. Cleveland. You won't see Bronny transferring to Cleveland exactly. State. Let's put it that way. Kyrie Irving. You know, is the kind of weirdo that would really love a city like Cleveland. Yeah. <laughs> he, moved to, he moved to the Nets to get out of Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> Fond memories for Chuck Webner. I mean, uh, he, he'll always consider Cleveland to be one of the highlights yeah, of his life. Yeah, that's great. Now, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's our number one. Go final for yourself is one Caitlin Clark, who is the story of the year, but also is a filthy, disgusting liar. <laughs> right, well, good luck, uh, Professor, with your wagers. And uh, we, we will talk to you again next week. You guys have a great one. Yeah, All right. Sounds good. Kids. The Professor, ladies and gentlemen, the big boy. Oh, that was God, a classic. That was yeah. That was, that was I so mean, it started way back with Rich Eisen. That was uh, and the fat shaming. Fantastic. All right, we got to run. Uh, Louis will be uh, out at the track later on today. It uh, looks like a gorgeous day for it, too. Yeah, the weather's fantastic. Wall Street Park, uh, Joe Bayesian Company, always taking good care of us. So, uh, Louis uh, has been ordering uh, as if we were going to the chair. And uh, <laughs> a lot of good stuff. Underrated, though. I, I know it doesn't quite meet the uh, you know distinguished standards uh, of one Michael Q. Mayo, but because uh, he's a sashimi guy. But those, uh, those uh, roles are, are great. No, they do right. a great job. No, it's impressive. They have sushi a, rolls uh, are, are really, right really good. Yeah. yeah. He does a great job. I, I like them. I mean, uh, I don't have any. Uh, I, I, I consider myself uh, trying exotic things by eating a, a California roll. <laughs> does that qualify you to be a complete sushi douchebag that you would even consider That's ordering standard, one? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll have the California roll. <laughs>
What is that like ordering? I mean, uh, it's just like a burger. I don't know. Yeah. It's, that's as standard as it gets. Right. I mean, and that uh, is their standard role. Like you could color. look like any more of an amateur, mm-hmm. except when I also eat the ginger with the uh, the sushi fine. roll piece. You know, it steps your game up a little. Mayo. I mean, he gave me some shit about that. He said that that's a palate cleanser, my friend. Oh, no, well, whatever. I don't you eat it's, there. it's like getting a little uh, thing of sherbet, you know, in between courses and you're thinking, "Wow, good. Ice cream now. Why don't we bring yes. the rest of this out here? <laughs> Fuck this little drop." <laughs> <laughs> this meal sucks if I got to cleanse my palate after the appetizers. Get out of here. All right, uh, we're going to get out of here. Uh, we'll be at uh, 10 Pops Gulfstream Park uh, later on this afternoon, one o'clock, and uh, that's a great way to wrap up the week. Uh, for Mike Luby Lubitz, I'm Jeff DeForest. Thanks, uh, the professor. Great job as always. Uh, enjoy your weekend, everybody. Going to be a lot of fun. And we will see you on Monday with the next edition of the Defoe Show as we leave you now that. The time. It's 914. Let's go to eat a damn snack. Let's go to my show.